This is criminal profiler Pat Brown, and this is Hangout number 63. Uh, before I get going, uh, please do tell me if you can hear and see me properly. We had a few problems last time, so let me know that while I welcome everybody here in the chat room, which is quite full. Michaela is here. Christian is here. Uh, Lisa N is here. Benny's here. Um, Mary is here. Uh, I'm trying to go through all the nut. Bree is here. David's here. Aisha's here. Gretchen's here. Hold on a second. So I'm waiting for. Uh, okay, so you can tell. Um, an amazing Mavis is here. Oh, that's great. Wait a minute. I can't see. <laughs> My glasses are fogging up, and I couldn't read anything. Jean is here. Welcome, welcome. Um, <laughs> if I missed you, it's because. Oh, Velocity Girl is here. Awesome. So we have new people here now, and that's great. Um, okay, let me see if I can see. Oh, that's better. <laughs> I swear to God, it just suddenly fogged over. So if you'd like to be in the chat room, uh, please do click below on Patreon. Join Patreon and you can come to all the live chats. Um, and also please do subscribe to the channel, like this video, hit your notification, little bell, so you get notified when I put out stuff. And uh, if you have a case you're interested in, go to the search engine at YouTube and put in Profiler Pat Brown and the victim's name or the killer's name and see if I've done that. And if I haven't, no. Oh, you can message me. All right. So I know what's ever on everybody's mind is Delphi because I did, I've done three videos and I don't usually do that many on a case in a short period of time, but there it was just kind of necessary. I did one on the day they announced they arrested someone. I did another one after the press conference. And then I got so many questions. I did a third one, an hour long one answering people's questions. Um, and I think I've done a pretty good job of that, but there's a couple questions left over. So I'm going to um, talk about that here. But just before I go to Delphi, I want to <laughs> I want to warn you guys, um, uh, Thanksgiving is coming up and you might like to travel to your family uh, and you want to bring your own food. You know, instead of making it there, you just want to bring it on the plane. Now, you can do that, mind you, because a lot of people think you can't. You can. Um, I brought food when I've been traveling, for example, I was in China once uh, with my daughter and we loved this one noodle place. It had the best noodle and eggplant ever. So we bought a whole pile of it, brought it on the plane, ate it while we were on the plane, enjoyed it very much. And then when I got home, I brought the leftovers to my son. And, and when I knocked on the door and he opened, I said, delivery, <laughs> Chinese takeout, really? You know, <laughs> you can take that as long as it's not soup. It has to be something solid. So you can take items with you. And apparently you can take chicken, maybe not a turkey, that might not fit, but a, a chicken. So somebody <laughs> brought a uncooked chicken on a flight. This woman got on at Fort Lauderdale International Airport, and she was flying to Port-au-Prince, uh, Haiti. And apparently she was bringing this chicken on and she got stopped. Now the problem wasn't the chicken, you know, that wasn't the issue. That wasn't it. The chicken was fine. But unfortunately, inside the chicken, where's my picture of that? Oh, now I'm going to lose my picture. Oh, come on now. There it is. There it is. Inside the chicken, she had a gun. <laughs> so she stuffed the chicken with a gun, thinking, thinking somehow this was going to get through security. It did not. So don't stuff a gun in your chicken. That's, that's my advice for this holiday season coming up. <laughs> People do the dumbest things. I swear to God, they do such dumb things. Um, <laughs> oh, they wouldn't be happy about the, the gun and the chicken? Oh, why not? Why not? <laughs> I thought Pat was going to say she wanted to bring a live chicken on the plane. No, I, I, I that's not usually my style. <laughs> I, brought, I brought other things. No chickens, no. Um, uh, Midge is here too. Welcome, Mitch. Okay, so now, hold on a second. I'm trying to click on right things. All right, to Delphi. Okay, what do I want to say about Delphi? Uh, the first thing I want to say about Delphi, because this is an issue that keeps on going. 
this person over here says they did a horrible job. This person over there here says they did the best job. We have no clue. We're on the outside of the investigation. Um, when I give my opinions on investigations, I give them on the basis of what I know. I uh, talk about how investigations might be conducted in a good way. I sometimes talk about things that I think, eh, maybe there would have been a better way to approach that, uh, especially in serial homicide investigations. Um, because a lot of uh, there's a lot, very little training in that because a good portion of police departments don't expect to get serial homicides. So nobody gets the training. And sometimes the training is really questionable. Sometimes it's just a whole lot of psychology and not a lot of useful. Here's what you do when you get that case. Um, so I wouldn't be surprised if Delphi suffered from that. Um, yes, they might have brought the FBI in as consultants. Um, I don't know if the FBI gives good and good. Um, good methodology to them or not. <laughs> I'm not there to hear what they're saying. Um, so I don't know how well this case went. Uh, so I don't know whether they did a great job all the way through, you know, and it's a hard, it's a serial homicide is extremely difficult to solve. And I do think this is a serial killer case. So what the reason it's so hard is a killer, a predator targets somebody who is not highly linked to him like it's not his girlfriend it's not the person he is partner of some sort it's usually some relative stranger even if they knew them from hmm, around town or something like that it could be a, a, a co-worker they don't spend much time with they might go for that but the police when they get these cases they're looking around town going okay we have no clue we don't know who it is because we don't have specific links to this that the, the that we could see why the person was killed, um, like in a gang bang, gang bang thing, or um, or drug deal gone bad, or husband kills wife, you know that kind of thing. You have no suspects, or you actually have the entire town as suspects, and you have everybody from out of town as suspects because maybe somebody was visiting, maybe a trucker was coming through. You don't know, so they're very difficult crimes to solve. And there's a lot of pressure to solve them, especially in this case, which was so unusual because of the two girls being killed at the same time and the whole catfishing thing that the whole community and the whole Internet world and everybody is they were under huge pressure. I don't know whether they use good techniques or bad techniques. I don't know. They may have done a bang up case, just a wonderful investigation this whole way through. And we don't know it yet. We won't, we won't know that till later to find out how they came to arrest Richard Allen, what they have on Richard Allen, how they got evidence enough to arrest Richard Allen, whether Richard Allen was a true suspect from early on or not. It's possible they were looking the wrong way for five years, not their fault necessarily. And suddenly Richard Allen popped up and they went, oh, we never thought it was him. <laughs> that happens. It's not necessarily... A bad investigation is just a very difficult one. So I'm not here to say their investigation was good or their investigation was bad. And I think nobody else should either. We're happy they got somebody arrested. We do. I do believe it's the right guy or they wouldn't have arrested him. Um, so that's the one thing I wanted to talk about. Now, the other thing I want to talk about is the photos, because this kind of this is where I run into problems uh, with, with, with Doug Carter. And, and I didn't know, I've had people say, stop being mean to Doug Carter. I love Doug Carter. It's like, uh, no, I might like Doug Carter too. I might like to go out, have a beer with him and think he's the greatest guy ever. But I do, and, I, and again, behind the scenes, I don't know, he might have run a great investigation. So I'm not commenting on his investigation. I continually comment on his outreach to the public because I do not like it. I have to say that. And I want other police departments, other people who might do this in the future to stop doing this. Um, early on, he started, he started this game with a, with a serial killer. We know you're, we know who you are. We're out there. We're going to get you. You know, you're just out here. It's, it's a game that doesn't work. And it makes, in my opinion, you look silly. Uh, and the, that, and I'm looking at it from a serial killer's point of view, who's going, <laughs> That's pretty funny, dude. <laughs> you know, it doesn't work. I think it's better to just come out very calmly, say, this is the situation. Here is the uh, here is a 
profile of the person we're looking for, da, 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 da. Here's the evidence that will support what we're looking for. We want you in the community to look for this person and, and get that information to us so we can, we can continue with our investigation until its conclusion and success. That's what you say. Now, he's, in my opinion, he's kind of a blowhard. I'm sorry. He's just one of those guys. If you give him more beer, he probably <laughs> talk for 10 hours. He's that kind of guy. Doesn't mean that he's a bad guy, just that kind of guy. All right. So when he came out and um, sort of very emotional that they'd caught somebody, I didn't really have a problem with that. Um, after the fact, you know, you've worked on this for so many years. You, you have you have concern for the family. You have you, you finally think you're getting justice for the family. I'm OK if you want to shed a few tears. I, I didn't have an issue with that at all. Um, then he, then he came out about the photos and he did this interview and I'm like, oh my God, he's back at it again. All right, let me tell you what bothers me because it's a lot of misleading information and it isn't the way things work. <laughs> and it's almost like fantasy land. I'm like, stop doing that because we want to do well with serial homicide investigations. And the more we put out nonsense, the more problems we have. So what am I talking about? You ask. All right. So, um, here we have Doug Carter, state police superintendent, and he gave this interview. All right. Now, I'm going to tell you what was said during this interview and where I have an issue. All right. The uh, guy who was interviewing him said this. Two years into the investigation, we were told not to rely on that sketch anymore. In other words, there was a first sketch and a second sketch, right? All right. So we had the first sketch, and then two years later, some other sketch. So the interviewer says, we were told not to rely on that sketch anymore. This was a new sketch that came out looking completely different. And I, I wondered about that myself. I'm like, okay, one guy looks uh, maybe toward 40 and the other guy looks like he's 22, maybe 25. They don't look a bit alike. Clearly to me, these would likely be two different people. Okay. They would, they'd be two different people. Um, I don't, you know, the witnesses. I just want to tell you about witnesses, first of all. You're walking along, you're walking along a path, right? And you're, um, you, you're not, you, you don't know girls have been killed, okay? So first of all, you have to understand that in your head, you're not saying, oh my gosh, you know, I better, better look for some guy because he's killed some girls. No, that is not what you're saying, all right? <laughs> that isn't it, Okay. So you're walking along. Hold on a second. I'm trying to find a picture because I want I want to, I want to send this picture over because it just makes me laugh. Um, and I forgot to put it up here. So hold on one second. I'm trying to do two things at once, which doesn't always go well. All right, I'm going to send this one over. All right, it's now coming over. All right, so you got these people, and they're walking about, and they. During that day, they're not looking for, it's not like they saw a wanted poster and are looking for the guy. They're just, you know, and then some people go by. Later on, two girls are found murdered. And now the police say, did you see someone? Well, okay, they're in a park. I've been in parks. I see lots of people in parks, especially, you know, lots of people. So why am I picking this particular person to say I saw this person? Maybe it's just a regular person walking by. I don't know. And let me tell you something else. If a regular person walks by who has nothing to do with the crime and, and a sketch is made that sort of looks like them, they probably don't want to run to the police and say, oh, yeah, that was me. <laughs> because then they're going to become a suspect. And all they're, so they're just going to hide in their basement. You know, go, hope they don't think it's me. That's for an innocent guy. So but people will say that and then they're going to give their description of the guy. Witnesses are notoriously terrible at giving really great descriptions unless they we're like staring at the person a really long time and they're really good at um, at face, at getting faces, okay? Um, there are those people, there really are. Um, my, my most amazing time ever, I, I could not believe this happened, but um, normally I did my uplinks uh, to CNN and all the other uh, studios for TV out of Washington DC. But I also went back and forth sometimes to Minnesota so I was out there and would uplink out of Minneapolis. One day I went to a college and I was dressed in a Muslim Indian outfit with a veil and everything because I was doing dancing with this group. 
we were practicing for a performance. And and in a, uh, down below, or no, on, on our lever, there were people coming in going to a deaf program. And they would come in and then they would stand there and they'd be signing to each other like, where is it? Where is it? Where is it? And they got confused between the two levels. And I saw this happen. I said, oh, I'm not dancing right now. So I'll just go out and direct traffic because I sign American Sign Language. So I went out and they're like, where is it? I'm like, okay, you know, you want to go that way, go down the stairs. There's an auditorium. That's it. Okay. You want the deaf show, right? And, and I started doing this. this. And after a while, three people came in. There was a 40-year-old woman and her parents. They came up. They're all signing. And again, same thing. They're searching, looking confused. And I went, are you searching for the, sh the, the show? And they're like, yeah. I'm like, okay, again, go downstairs. There's another, that way. And they, they oh, thank you, thank you, thank you. Then they start leaving. And they're leaving, going to the door. The 40-year-old woman turns around, looks at me from a distance and says, oh, my God, I just want to tell you, I love you on Nancy Grace. And I'm like, what? I'm dressed in a Muslim Indian outfit in Minneapolis. I'm not even speaking. <laughs> I have makeup on and big earrings. And I'm like, and you recognize my face? I, I was blown away, absolutely blown away. There, there are those kind of witnesses. Then you have witnesses like me. If you asked me, if you, you said tomorrow, your, your daughter has disappeared. And we have an artist here, since you don't have any photos, for whatever reasons, I don't have a photo. <clears throat> but okay, let's say I didn't have a photo. Maybe I was, I lost my phone and the internet. <laughs> no photo. What does your daughter look like? Describe her. Let me show you what I would describe. That would be it. I haven't a clue how to describe my daughter. I don't have a clue how to describe her nose. I don't know what her nose looks like or her eyes or her mouth or her ears. I got nothing. <laughs> I got nothing. Why is that? I guess if I'm using one of the dentikits, I might do a little bit better. My, oh yeah, that look, so, you know, starts looking like her maybe. I suck, all right? So what happens is when you get witnesses, you might get people who are really good or you just might get people like me who are totally useless. Um, and then they give a description because they want to help. And this description is crap. Um, the next problem with those descriptions is a lot of times they look like a lot of people. They do. And where's where's my favorite? Where's my favorite one of what when they look like somebody else and it isn't even them. No, I forgot to put this up, too. I am having a all right. For some reason, I'm having missing things again. All right. I got them now. All right. So. Uh, this is one these are two of my favorites on this this is a guy they're looking for and this is this is the tv the host of the news show saying we're looking for this guy <laughs> and you're like isn't that you <laughs> isn't that you <laughs> sure looks like him this is my absolute favorite <laughs> They're looking for that rapist, <laughs> you know, and it's like, hmm, hmm, let me, let me call the police right now, dude. <laughs> so this is, this is how much people can look like each other or the, or the actual, the actual description is bad. The sketch just isn't really representative. Okay. Or it isn't even anything to do with the actual guy who committed the crime because the two the two photos, I mean, the two sketches they have, all right, the two sketches they have, where's my two sketches? Okay, these two sketches, they have not one shred of proof that these two guys had one thing to do with the crime, not one shred of proof, okay? So anyway, so the guy asked him about that, and then Carter, our good friend Carter, um, says, I will answer that in two parts. All right. I'm not sure what the two parts were, but okay. He starts off like saying this. Isn't that amazing? The Alan looks more, oh, I'm sorry. The, the, the guy said Alan looks more like the first sketch, the first sketch than the other sketch. Okay. Carter says, isn't that amazing that he looks a lot like one and a little like the other? <laughs> what? He looks a lot like one and a little like the other. Okay, I'm like, what part of the other one does he look a little like? I don't know. And then he says this interesting thing. Depending on the eye of the beholder. 
right? Well, yeah, that's the problem. The eye of the beholder, we tend to see things as we want to see them. Oh, man, that, that Allen guy looks just like that guy when he doesn't necessarily. Uh, and the, so he says, he admits in the eye of the beholder. Then he says, I have said all along, these photos are not photographs. Well, that's true. They're sketches. So they're not going to be exact is what he's trying to say. Then he, and he goes on a little bit. He, he does word salad, um, word salad, but I couldn't say, like, I'm like, what the heck is he talking about? Anyway, then he says some more word salad that says detectives change the investigation logistically, which I agree with as the, the investigation goes on depending on the information you get, you logistically change your methodologies, who you're looking at and all that kind of things, whether you're going to go to the public with a new photo, a new uh, sketch or what you're going to do. That's true and reasonable because as new evidence comes in and time goes on, you do change your methodologies or what you're, what you, know, what you need to do, or what you think might work. Then he says this, the detectives changed the investigation logistically and what they know comes comes from the com people in the community and around the world. Literally, or from around the world. I'm like, what in God's name are you talking about? <laughs> around the world? <laughs> We're not talking about international crime. We're talking about a little teeny crime, oh, it's a terrible crime, of two murdered girls in a small area of, of Indiana. Why would people around the world be helping out the detectives in a way that is meaningful. I'm like, what? I have no idea what the guy's talking about. This is my problem with Doug Carter speaking in public because he says stuff that just doesn't make sense. All right, let's go on. So I believe, says Doug Carter, they absolutely did the right thing at the time when the sketches are just sketches. And when they are done with this, when they are done with this, not when, not, not they were done with this, when they were done with this, we are going to be able to meld the two of them together and we're going to find that individual and that's what happened <laughs> okay <laughs> all right so so at this point they they do this if you if you i'll put the i'll put the link below because what they do is they take these two photos and they go woo together and then they come up with this photo on the left that's a composite of the two photos and now see that's what did he say? We're going to meld the two of them together and we're going to find the individual. So, so now he's claiming by, by overlapping those two photos, they had a perfect photo of Richard Allen. And that's how, that's what happened. And that's how they caught him. Okay. Sorry. Okay. Let's take a look at these two photos. First of all, <laughs> first of all, uh, the guy's eyes are too far uh, and the left are far, far apart. And Allen's eyes are close, close together. Alan has like freaking no eyebrows at all. And the guy on the left has really, really nice eyebrows. Uh, Alan's nose is very thin. And the guy on the left, his nose is quite thick. Um, let's see. Uh, let's look at his lips. I, uh, Alan's lips turn downward. That lip, that guy's lips go outward. The guy's fatter in the face. I'm sorry. I don't see any, any absolute match in, at all. I just don't see it. I think it's in your head, Doug Carter. And I think you want people to believe that's how it happened, which makes no sense whatsoever. I don't believe you found him just because you went, some photos. Oh my God, that's Richard Allen from the CVS. I don't believe that. I believe he was found in some other more rational manner. Um, I do. Now, it doesn't mean somebody couldn't have just said to them, it's, we think it might be Richard Allen, but not by putting those two together do you come up with Richard Allen. Richard Allen actually looks more like the first guy um, before you put the second guy on top of him. But I don't know why he feels a need to tell the public why he had these two things out. He could simply say, we had two different descriptions. We don't even know if one of them was even Richard Allen. That would be honest. I would have said that right up front. When I when those things came out, I, or came out I'd say, here we have a composite of somebody was seen on the trail. We'd like to know who this person is. That's it. Second one comes out. Hey, we've had another uh, another person say they believe they saw a person like this out that way. We'd like to know if you know anything about this person. You can be honest and straightforward and not <laughs> do all this stuff that just is to me is nonsensical. I just, I, I, I'm so, yeah, no, I, got, I get it. You like Doug Carter. You think his heart's in it. That's fine. 
I don't know what he's doing behind the scenes. It might be perfectly great, great investigation, but I just wish he'd stop coming to the public with this stuff that is not very useful. Now, I, I do want to point out people, now the comments, I, I saw two comments come in, which I thought were kind of interesting because and this is what happens when you get these kind of comments. All right. The first one, let me find it. All right. This person, I'm not going to give his name, came out with that, with the picture, with the video of that. This guy says, the sketches were strategically created. Strategically created. No one is listening to Carter's words. He literally says, isn't that amazing? The, that the suspects looks a little like one and a little bit like the other, a lot like one, a little bit like the other. Meld the two together and you'll have the right individual. That's what happened. And he goes on. Uh, the one, there weren't ever two separate sketches of the killer. It's one sketch divided. Sketches, uh, simply they didn't want to put, wait a minute. It's one sketch divided. Simply put, they didn't want to tip the guy that they believed committed the murder off prior to, prior to gathering enough evidence to get a solid conviction. But at the same time, it's just enough for tip, tips to come, to tweak it. So tips will come in. <laughs> I'm sorry, dude. I don't know where you come up with this stuff. I don't know what, what shows you've been watching on television. No, he, this was not a strategic to separate, to like get the guy, get a drawing of Richard Allen and then just pick out some of him over here and pick out some of them over there. Oh, that'll spark people's minds. It's just, this is just a silliness. Um, another guy says, except neither are him. The guy in the first, first sketch was identified and cleared. I don't know if that's even true. And the second sketch is so far off, it's obviously not him because he's a very young, much younger guy. So, so see, this is what happens. Once you start saying nonsense to the public, nonsense comes back. And then it just confuses people. And I don't think that's necessary. I think you can just be very straightforward, very calm when you give out this information, which is why I often believe in having somebody represent the department of to, to not necessarily the investigators involved or the police chief or the sheriff, but a, a person that that's his job is, a, you know, to give public information. So he gets out there and he's like across the board, giving the proper information to the public without all the emotions and the nonsense and the confusing stuff. You know, some people aren't good public speakers and maybe shouldn't be doing it. And I don't think Doug Carter comes across well and, I think you should just stop doing that stuff. Let, some, let somebody from your department do it and go on with your job. But I think he likes the spotlight. I do. I think I think he, he likes to talk. And so he does. We can't stop him. So that's my that's my thing on Delphi. Uh, let me check on some of your comments here. Um, let's see. Um, Oh, yes. It's, okay. Michaela says, in my humble opinion, he looks more like the first sketch. Oh, absolutely. I think so, too. Um, we see. Howdy here. Yeah. Hi. Uh, was the first sketch just based on the video and the second was based on a witness? I have no clue. I, again, one of the things we have to be aware of from outside an investigation is there's a lot of information that they haven't given out and a lot of misinformation on the Internet by people who want to claim stuff that they don't know. <laughs> so I have no clue. Unless they told me, I don't know. Um, apparently he went to the police and told them he was at the bridge on the day of the murders. What a dumbass. Again, I don't know. All right. Um, <laughs> Reticent Robin says, oh, I'm the same way. I'd make a terrible witness. I'm also unobservant too. Yeah, we're, you know, yeah, we're two peas in a pod there. Um, people think because I'm a criminal profiler that I'd be really great uh, with description um, with memory. <laughs> if you've been here long enough of me, you know, my memory sucks. That's why I always go, somebody tell me, well, let me look on the internet. Yeah. I can't, I have so much information in my head. I can't keep it all in. Um, I can't access it all. Um, but I've never been good with description. Um, when I write my fic one fiction book, only the truth you'll find is what's called spare fiction. The, um, uh, because I don't do great description because I don't care. Uh, to me, that's a wall. I don't really want to describe wallpaper because I have no way to describe it. It's like a fuchsia, a fuchsia flower. <laughs> it's not me. So I make a lousy witness. I do. Um, and that's just a fact. Um, the zombie sketch. Yeah, that pretty much my poor children. I got three zombies then. I can't do better. Um, 
that well if he was from the video they would have some idea he was a guy well they don't the thing is they had the video and if that was a sketch that was associated with it they might the thing that they would might be able to do is yes place him in a location so i don't object to them putting that sketch out to the public i just i you know the second one i don't understand the second one at all um um, I don't mean you're unobservant. Yes, I am. <laughs> no, but I am. I'm, I'm terrible. <laughs> and apparently unobservant is not a word. Oh, according to your phone. Okay. Well, we're creating a new language. <laughs> you know, I, they, I, this is the strangest thing. I can't figure this one out. So I have been in, I have been studying psychopaths for years. I have, I have spoken about psychopaths on thousand television shows because that's my favorite word. And I swear to God, ever since whenever, I have always said psychopathy. It seemed right to me. Like, it's like, I don't know. And it's weird. I don't know whether people used to say psychopathy, but now it's psychopathy. And I don't ever remember hearing 20, 25 years ago, the word psychopathy. Or what I thought, you know, if I'd been listening to forensics people and psychologists and all of that, you would think I would know the word, the pronunciation of psychopathy. But I've always said psychopathy. And, and now the only thing I hear now is psychopathy. And I've been looking, trying to see if 20 years ago it was different, but I can't find that out. So either I was unobservant 20 years ago and misspoke the word, a word that I used, like every time I spoke, it's kind of embarrassing. <laughs> I'm now going to say psychopathy, although I like my version better. I don't know, maybe some country I was in that said, I keep looking, I looked up Australia's version, the UK version, <laughs> Indian version, just trying to, you know, make myself feel better. Um, <laughs> um, let's see. Uh, Midge says, ignore your phone, Robin. It speaks English as an additional language. <laughs> I had I had teaching my Samsung spell, spell checker to swear. <laughs> That's great. Um, so then why not meld them together and release that? Well, there's an interesting thing. Well, according to this fellow, on the internet who is nameless he says oh this was a st strategy and doug carter says they have these strategies i don't know see the thing just doesn't make a whole lot of, a whole lot of sense at all so uh, they, they both have a goatee well there you go that'll do it <laughs> um let's see uh one result of releasing the second sketch from listening to interviews was that many new tips came in for young men closer to the age of the girls was that useful I don't know. Some people will swear to God that, um, you know, one of the Kleins, uh, younger Klein, although I don't think it looks like the younger that sketch at all. Um, I don't know. This is this is the stuff that just floats around and no one has any clue. <laughs> Both have two eyes. See, I noticed that. I did. I got that. Um, Benny says the brain is using face sense to recognize and remember faces, but it uses a pattern of similar facial expressions to make us think we see the same face. Oh, that's very interesting, Benny. It is often wrong as many faces share the same something. Uh, let's say, wait a minute, you must, must have said something else here. The same, okay, let me see here. Uh, the face face sense is making some people say that I look just like Brandon Fraser. <laughs> and other people say I look like James Dean. The latter is more mostly only myself saying that. <laughs> this is so true. And, you know, we all have different abilities in our brains. I, I, I say I have, I have partial what I consider face blindness because I can't sometimes recognize my children in a crowd. I, I see people over and over again. And I, I could not identify them. You know, um, I have to know them really super, super, super well. And then I have to have them in a situation where I know they should be. I've had that all my life. Um, and, uh, and I also can't remember names. So there you go. Um, it's just not my thing. <laughs> what does Bishop say? They do seem to have a communication liaison. Oh, thank God. The guy that introduced the day and Carter at the last press conference. Well, then he should have not had Carter come in. He should have just been the guy, you know, one guy without all the, the fancy stuff. You know what I mean? And without all the other stuff going on, one spokesman for that, that case. Um, I, I, that, I really strongly believe that. Um, now this is interesting. And Michaela says the police are backpedaling over the sketches to justify crap policing. I don't know, Michaela. This is why I say, be careful. We don't know if their policing was good or bad. We don't know if the investigation, they did their best and it was just, you know, it was hard investigation. We don't know if they were on the right track and then finally got there or they were going down blind alleys with red herrings and then finally got there for some reason. But yes, they might be 
trying to justify what had happened before to try to pull it all together. Like we were on the case properly, you know, five years ago, and now we're still there because we were working our way forward. And that sounds more like politics to me than, than reality. So that's, that's my particular view on that. Um, uh, I think, yeah, they might, a lot of people just, I th I'll tell you what people do like about Carter, uh, you know, um, and I don't know about the, the community of, of uh, Delphi, but you know, the internet people, a lot of people like that he seems to have a good heart, a caring for the victims. And that's fine. I mean, I don't object to that. I mean, that's that's nice. If the, if, a, if a person working on a case has a heart for the victims, that's great because that might keep him working on the case and, and getting it solved. So there's nothing wrong with that. Um, so yes, that, may be, that might be true, but I wish he would do more concise things. <laughs> <laughs> even though maybe he shouldn't. Yeah, I think so. So anyway, that's my little thing on um, Delphi. Um, and the next thing I want to talk about is Debbie Collier. And because Debbie Collier, people have been asking me, what about that case? What, what, what progress has there been in the Debbie Collier case? Um, so let me, let me go there. Um, Debbie Collier, her son just spoke up. And, and there's, you know, I don't like to talk about cases when I don't know anything or don't have enough information, or it's just stalled and I'm just going to make up crap. But I thought this is important. This is Debbie Collier and her son. Now, the son is very upset. Why is that? Well, because they haven't solved the case of what happened to his mother. But let me tell you something that the, this is what people overlook all the time, which is very important. Okay, let me find. Okay. So this, the story is, not a people, um, son, quest, oh, son questions surveillance video. This is interesting. So Debbie Collier goes missing. Um, and then her body is found in this strange location. Uh, she's been, she's dead. We don't know exactly what she's been murdered or was suicide or whatever it was. Um, and it, she, uh, let me, let, uh, maybe I should pull up the, in case you don't know, I should pull up uh, at least a basic story on it. Hold on a second. All right, here we go. Uh, Collier was last seen leaving her house on September 9th with only her ID and her debit card. The Habersham County Sheriff's Office has released surveillance footage from the family dollar store in Clayton, Georgia, which allegedly, I, I, that's a weird word, allegedly, because it is her. And I mean, unless there's, she's got a, you know, doppelganger, it's her, right? Allegedly shows Collier, 59 years old, entering the store at 2.55 p.m. on September 10th, the day she was reported missing. So she goes in there and, and then they show her leaving 14 minutes later. Now, the footage from the store shows the person who is believed to be Collier. <laughs> now she's not alleged; she's believed to be. Um, okay, uh, that's better. Okay, at the register, buying a refillable torch lighter, a rain poncho, paper towels, a blue tarp, and an orange reusable tote bag. When her body was found, she was found next to the tarp and the tote bag, according to the report. And so. But she was seen going into the store, she seen leaving the store, and supposedly went to her vehicle and didn't leave with anybody. She looked perfectly happy. I looked at the video. She looked normal. She just went in the dollar store and bought all this stuff. Okay. Now, the son says this. Bearden says, that's the son. I don't know what's his name. Hold on a second. Okay, let me tell you a little bit more of it. Okay, so let me go back here. All right, so this was the last she was seen was in the store. All right, so hold on a second. it's a long article, um, and it's been nearly two months since she went missing. She was found dead under mysterious circumstances in the Chattahoochee Oconee National Forest in Georgia. Um, son is Jeffrey Bearden. He says the last two months have been very hectic and frustrating and heartbreaking. My family's trying the best to stay, to, to stay together, stay as a unit, and try to just try to remember my mother during all of this time too. He says he's been frustrated with a lack of information he has received from law enforcement regarding his mother's case. According to Bearden, most of the information he has received about the case has come via the media. And he says his family wasn't invited to the Habersham County Sheriff's Department press conference regarding his mother's case. When he reached out to the sheriff himself, he said he, la uh, he lost even more confidence in the investigation. I had spoken to the sheriff, Mr. Joe Joey Terrell, and I had a pretty unpleasant phone call with him. Uh, Bearden says that during the 10 minute phone call, Terrell laughed at him as he was expressing his concerns about his family's safety and the status of the investigation into Collier's death. Okay. My entire goal of the conversation really was just to get 
to be better up to date because there's a lot of information that my family has received through the media that we necessarily haven't gathered from law enforcement. And that's been incredibly challenging. All right. I understand why the son is frustrated. Um, I will tell you this sometimes when, when, when families talk to police departments, the, a lot of times, and this is just a reality, a lot of times people who go into police work aren't the best communicators and the warmest communicators, okay? That just, that's just a reality. It's just everybody has, it's like someone who's a rocket scientist probably has a personality that's different from somebody who is a dancer or an artist, you know? And that, you know, so there's certain personalities and law enforcement tends to be less um, on the huggy, warmy side most of the time. Um, so they also get tremendous amount of phone calls and they get very um, defensive, shall we say, and they get fed up. And, and then so when, sometimes when the family or somebody calls to try to get information, they're very curt with them, um, not necessarily very friendly, uh, and push them off. And so it it's, sometimes doesn't go well. I, I, I think there is a good idea for law enforcement to find a better way to communicate. I do think that some kind of uh, more training should be done in that because, okay, I know what you're thinking. This person's a looney tune. This person's obnoxious. This person's this or that. But still. I learn to have a pleasant voice, like you're actually listening to them. You can figure out how to shorten the conversation, but you know, don't just be rude. Um, and he said the guy laughed because he was worried for his family's safety. Well, I find that kind of interesting. And this gives me a hint to why the family might not be getting any information from the police. It is very possible that a family member is involved in the death of Debbie Collier. And if that's true, First of all, they cannot give any information out to the family because they're suspects. Secondly, they're not in danger because it's them, not some outsider who's going to come and get them. So that's what might be the problem in this case, that the police, uh, they may be, I don't know that they're looking in the right direction again. I'm not behind the scenes. They might be looking two ways, looking at some possibility out here, but also the family out here. The family has some issues. There are a lot of strange things that happened. Um, so that the, that the police might say, hey, wait a minute, I think the family's involved or somebody close to the family's involved. They can't give out information then. They just can't because they're going to tip off. They really will tip off the killer. So they're shutting down completely until they figure out which direction they need to go and who actually committed this crime. That's why the son can't get any information. Sometimes people don't understand that because he thinks his family's innocent. But they don't, they don't necessarily think that the police. And even if they are innocent, the police still might have to view them as suspects until they can clear them 100%. And maybe they haven't been able to do that. So that's, that's, that's my statement on that. I don't have any more to do with it because we don't have any more information. Uh, she's still you know, dead and we still don't have any more clues that have been given out to the public and I'm not going to gossip about it. So that is the reasoning though, why I think that the family hasn't got much information from anybody. So um, uh, <laughs> let me see what you all have to say here. Uh, we're going, we're back to Delphi. We should have a victim liaison officer. Oh, yes, that's also true. For this case, too, they should have a victim liaison officer because, yes, they're specifically trained to be nice, to be comforting, and all of that. And also, they can gather information. But, you know, generally speaking, their whole point is to be the, be the go between between the detectives who are also overwhelmed. I, I wish people would understand this. These cases these days are so difficult because our, our, our court system is so ridiculous that it's, it's becomes a nightmare to present a case in a court system. That's why it takes years sometimes to even get the thing to court because they the, the amount of stuff you have to go through is I just can't even explain how ridiculous it is. That's why so many cases they won't even waste their time with because there's too much damn work for what they're not going to get. So they have to focus on the most important cases, which means the citizens are going, well, aren't you going to go after that guy? And they're like, no, no we just, we, we're not going to waste our time. Sorry about your bad luck. But we can only focus on that which we have to. And that takes an overwhelming amount of time and legal stuff. And the state's attorney and this, oh, insane, absolutely insane. And politics enters in and, and it's not necessarily the police's fault. The politics enters in because they're under that umbrella. So it's a lot more difficult and confusing than people think. So while I have strong feelings about proper investigation and methodologies and 
do understand that sometimes the police go the wrong way. And sometimes I do believe that there are that occasionally, rarely is there a corruption type of issue. Most of the time, it's just, it's a nightmare. It's a nightmare that they, they, they're trying to handle the case. And so I think people need to have, give them a little bit of a, give them a little bit of a break on that, but they do have, I think a communication problem because again, the, the uh, law enforcement tends to draw in kind of tough people and they're not necessarily the cuddliest. You know? <laughs> just saying. Okay. So that's my thing on, on, on Debbie, Debbie Collier. Now I just, just for a little break from the worst, worst stuff here. I just want, I, I want, I want to do a little bit about psychology because I just think these two cases are kind of interesting in, um, this is Dear Abby things. And sometimes she kind of misses the point. Um, sometimes she's got it right. Again, I don't always have it right either. This one, <laughs> Dear Abby, an aspiring pianist, miffed his wife is indifferent to his uh, artistic pursuits. And I'm going to ask you guys in the chat room to give your, your psychological analysis of this, okay? Of what you think actually is going on here. Dear Abby, I'm a married middle-aged man and the father of two. Although I work as a banker, I'm also an aspiring pianist. I have practiced two to three hours a day for many years. My music is unique, unlike anything ever heard. My wife of 18 years does not appreciate my music. She never comments on it, never pays a compliment, and never supports me about it. I do receive praise from my transcriber, my recording editor, my audio engineer, strangers, friends, my parents, and my eight-year-old daughter. I'm tempted to call our marriage quits, but divorce, as we all know, is messy, and she's a good mother and homemaker. Something else that makes me want to leave is that I'm good with the ladies. And in the past, I've had more than my share of female companionship. The combination of a wife who doesn't appreciate my art and the temptation of once again being the stud I was, and then in uh, parentheses, after a minor makeover and some weight loss, and resuming those wonderful adventures is enough incentive for me to end my marriage. Once my music starts hitting streaming platforms, I expect great things. But since my wife is indifferent to my artistic pursuit, I'm conflicted about whether I should remain married to her or risk a lot by getting a divorce. Please help me make the right decision. Okay, guys, what do you think? What do you think about what decision he should make? I'm going to take a little sip of my drink while I wait. <laughs> I, want to, I want to see how you profile that guy and what his needs are and what his decision should be. <laughs> that's great and Gretchen says total narcissist full of himself let's see delusions of grandeur says Bishop mm, you think he hasn't made it yet in 18 freaking years I'm not so sure he's going to go and make it yet Chris, Christian says run that's the wife that should run not him um, he's lucky to have her you, you think uh, yeah he was lucky to have her um, because according to him, he doesn't say one, all that she's good for her is being a mother and a homemaker. She's a servant. She is a servant. Um, Michaela says, dear, <laughs> dear Abby, my, <laughs> I love, I love you guys in the chat room. This is why I love Patreon. I mean, I don't get this, you know, in regular YouTube shows. And I say, I do them and the messages come in, but you know, because you guys are in my chat rooms, you just, you just make my day. Dear Abby, my sister is disabled and cannot satisfy her husband anymore sexually. I've been helping out. Am I doing the right thing? <laughs> well, I guess it depends on what your sis thinks. <laughs> uh, he's lucky to have her. Mm -hmm. Me, 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 says Christian. His wife is so sick of his shit. Oh, there you go. This is, I'm glad you said that. Glad you said that. That is, mm mm, -mm. Oh, this is true. All the people I pay say my music is fabulous. Yeah. You know, he's a banker, um, which is when people are paying you, they are going to say nice things. Right. And so, you know, it's always kind of funny because when, when producers call me to be on TV, talk about buttering me up to get me to do it, hopefully for free, because they don't like to pay people. So like, oh, my God, Pat, you're just the bad thing. I'm like, and as soon as I do the show, they're like, see ya. <laughs> 
<laughs> so when people want something, yeah. So the people he's paying, yes. Um, so for 18 years, he's been working on this style of music, which has never been heard before. And he's, and he's now going to go to a streaming platform. And he's paying a lot of people to do things. But I'll tell you the thing that got me the most. He's a banker, which means he, has, he probably has a pretty uh, full-time job and maybe more than full-time. In other words, he leaves early in the morning. He comes back maybe for dinner, maybe late for dinner um, and with his wife and two children. He ignores them. And he goes to his private room and for two to three hours, he plays music. I bet that wife is so damn sick of his damn music because obviously it's not, he's not gotten anywhere in all those years and he's so full of himself and he spends no time with the family because he's so busy playing his music. Apparently his wife doesn't need a, an evening off. He doesn't say, you know, I go, I play and then I make, sometimes and I let her, I take, make sure she gets to do things and I make sure we have a date night. None of that exists. It's all about him. He's a massive narcissist. He uses his wife to take care of his children and probably have sex with and, and, and cook food and take care of the house. She's a wonderful homemaker, so she's a servant. He has no interest in making her happy. Uh, she's sick to death of him. That's why she's, she's not going to walk around and go, oh, my God, that's this wonderful music when she wants to punch him in the face. Um, and now, now that he thinks he's going to get big, he's going to dump her because he thinks he's going to get some hot, you know, some hot young chicks to follow him around. He's going to get groupies because he's so brilliant. <laughs> you know, it's like, oh, let, let me tell you, her, let me tell you the answer. So anyway, Abby says, dear, dear music maker, it's time for some self-reflection. Are you simply unhappy in your marriage and using your music and past track record with the ladies as an excuse to leave? My suggestion is you postpone dyn dynamiting your marriage until after you have a few musical hits under your belt. No, Abby, he should get the hell out of that marriage because he's got enough money. That leaves, means he, when he divorces his wife, can give his wife her life back, pay enough money for alimony and child support, and she can find a man who isn't a massive narcissist like you, somebody who might actually care about her. That's what I would say. <laughs> you know, <laughs> because she needs to, she needs to get out of there. Mm -mm -mm. Yeah. <laughs> Only after a makeover though. So I'm going to say he's like, 18, okay, he's been married 18 years. So, you know, he's in his, uh, at least in his 40s, if not 50. And he's obviously got a few extra pounds on. So, yeah, so he's going to get his makeover. Mm -hmm. And he's going to get, uh, the music's going to bring him in. You know, the music, the music. <laughs> oh, I take care of her. Martin, you're so nice. <laughs> Women are waiting in line for you. We know that. <laughs> so that was my one dear Abby one. Now listen to this other one. This is the other one, which is kind of, I'm like, Here's, so you're going you're gonna to chime in here, too, as a psychological thing. This is Dear Amy. Okay. Overstepping neighbors tricked my 12-year-old into babysitting their biting kids. <laughs> you shouldn't laugh at all these things, but they're so funny. Okay. Dear Amy, I need help to set some boundaries with our neighbors who moved in two years ago. They are very friendly and sometimes bring us food or gifts for no reason. For example, they recently gave my 12-year-old son a used blender. Oh, and he was looking forward to a used blender, I'm sure. That was like, like he probably had that on his Christmas list, a used blender. I just love people who give you crap that they don't need anymore as gifts. Oh, I jumped ahead. Anyway, I feel guilty about my discomfort with them. Why? But at the same time, I'm quite introverted. That's not your problem. Your problem is that these people are creeps um, and you don't know how to walk away. And I need some time to decompress when I get home. The neighbors and their children, age four and five, are very outgoing. The neighbors and their children. Yeah, they're 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 like they like don't they don't have any boundaries. They're not outgoing, they're just they're aggressive and they're users. Uh, and the kids come to our house or yard at least four times a week. That's what the fence is for. Okay. Sometimes they look in the windows to see if we're home. <laughs> hey, little stalker people. If the front door is unlocked, the kids will walk right in. They're also burglars. <laughs> They're home invaders. And they argue if we ask them to go home. The neighbor's four-year-old is also unpredictably physical, and he will sometimes bite, hit, and kick people. He's a little psychopath. Um, the parents asked my son to come over last night to play. Why are, your, why are your neighbors asking your 12-year-old son to come over to play? That's just creepy right there. 
But then at some point, the four-year-old bit my son quite badly on the leg. <laughs> when my son came home and showed me the bite, I asked him where the parents were and, and then learned they had left the house and my son was babysitting their kids. They leave a 12-year-old boy without permission to babysit the four and five-year-old so they can do whatever they want to do. I'm not comfortable with their lack of boundaries. <laughs> You know, I love this is the this is where you see people downplay things. This is where people get in such trouble. They don't want to be mean, so they downplay everything these horrible human beings, which sound like psychopaths and narcissists and a few other things, creepy people, they downplay it to be nice. All right. I'm not comfortable with their lack of boundaries. I know there are much worse neighbors out there. Really? What <laughs> how much worse do they have to get? <laughs> oh my god. And I don't want to overreact. Yeah, you're, stalkers breaking into your house, having your son attacked, leaving your son to take care of children without permission. Oh yeah, they could get worse than that. I'm not sure how they get worse. The serial killer lives next door and he breaks in and rapes and murders you. Okay, I'll give you that one. And I don't want to overact, overreact, that overreact, uh huh, and cause a neighborhood war. How should I approach this? <laughs> The, now, Amy's better. She writes, are there worse neighbors out there? I'm not so sure. <laughs> Let me reframe this for you. <laughs> She's talking about building a fence um, and their invasions by the children, unsolicited gifts, all this crap. And you respond by feeling guilty. Yeah. All right. So what do you think about these neighbors? What would you do with those suckers? What would you do with them? Uh, Michaela says, why are you even talking to your neighbors? I've lived in the same house for 12 years. I've spoken to mine like twice. Well, you know, Michaela, I mean, it's nice to have good neighbors. I mean, we have some nice neighbors around here. We have spoken to them um, and they help out with, you know, we have some farm animals. So they come out. They're one of the teenage daughters at one of her jobs. And when we're out of town, if both my daughter and I are out of town, she gets paid to come over and take care of the llamas and the, and the alpacas and the horse and the donkey and the goat and all that. Um, and she loves it. And they're nice people. And I've, I've actually spent some time with the mom. Um, so we have another couple over there who they like to have barbecues. And so I would say it's great when you're friends with your neighbors. I absolutely think that's wonderful because neighbors should be neighborly and should help each other personally. Well, there's a good idea. Gretchen says, I'd start by locking your doors. You know, the, people sometimes don't do, I'm sorry, the, the easiest thing possible, the easiest things. And you might like to keep your doors open, but if you've got creepy neighbors who do that, you lock your doors. And you also, if they peek in your windows, you walk out and say, hey, don't peek in my windows because they've already invaded your privacy. You have the right to speak back to them. Hey, I don't know what you're doing, but get out of my bushes. It makes me uncomfortable. Don't do it. If you would like to see me, please do come around to the front door and knock. Uh, as far as your children coming over here four times a week, I can't handle that. Those are your kids. I don't really like kids. Uh, <laughs> you know, I, I, I come home from work. I want my peace and quiet. Please do not have your children come over. If they don't like you after that, maybe they'll stay on the other side of their property and not come over anymore. But if you, as long as you are going to be a sucker, they're going to abuse that living heck out of you. Um, <laughs> Shoot them. That sends a message to the community. Yes, you could do that too. <laughs> I mean, there's obviously, and the thing about the sun, let me see what she said about this. You now this see, I, I, I this I, again, I'm in disagreement with this with Amy. So some Abby, Abby and Amy are sometimes too nice. All right. No one should ever put, okay. The neighbors have over overstepped ex, ex, extremely. Yes. And unethically. Yes. That you no longer need to feel guilty. Yes, I agree with all that. No one should ever put your son in the position these people did. Correct. Asking a 12-year-old over to play and then leaving him sole charge of two young children is dangerous, ethic, unethical, and frankly, a little creepy. Yes. And you should call social workers. They didn't, she didn't say that. You should call the social workers. The fact that he came home with a wound on his leg is evidence he should not have been there. That's evidence that he was assaulted by your child. That's an assault. Um setting boundaries is not starting a war in fact is probably preventing one probably not but that's that's what you have to do when the children walk into your house uninvited tell them no 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 lock the doors oops you need to go home right now bye guys i'll watch you from the porch to make sure you get home no kids come over to your house you might start calling social services because parents aren't watching them you should tell these parents if you want my son to babysit oh no 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 what okay amy you just went off the deep end 
if you want my son to babysit, you're going to have to ask me or and I'll ask him. Otherwise, you should never be in your house without at least one other adult home. No, that those people should never, ever. If they ever ask your son to babysit, the answer to that is absolutely never, ever in a million years will my son ever enter your house again. Amy, Amy, you're putting the son in danger of God knows what because these people are, they got some kind of psychological uh, issues going on here and they're not good people. Um, so <laughs> I just like, don't be so nice. And the reason I say don't be so nice is that many times people get in trouble because they're too nice to people. So for example, when a woman, uh, let's say she bre girl breaks up with her boyfriend and this is what gets her killed. The boyfriend says, I understand why you broke up with me, but I just want to talk to you one more time. I just want to cl have closure. That stupid closure thing. So she goes to his house. And he ends up, he strangles her and hides her in the attic. No, if he wants closure, he doesn't need, first of all, you can do it on a telephone. He doesn't have to see your little face. You can do it on FaceTime these days. And if nothing else, you can do it in a public location where he cannot hurt you. you but you do not go to a private location with some guy you didn't trust, which is why you broke up with him, to give him closure because you want to be a nice person. No, stop being nice. Nice people deserve nice treatment. Not nice people deserve you to step away from them and say, I'm no longer, I'm not interested in having any kind of relationship with you. Sorry, done. Now, maybe 10 years from now, if you come back, you're a nice person, I'll reconsider. But no, I'm not putting myself in that situation. I will not be abused. I will not let you abuse my children, my husband, my wife, my girlfriend, whatever it is. I'm not going to, I'm not going to play that game. Um, go away. I don't, I, I don't owe you anything. You know, I don't. Anyway, that's my that's my little <laughs> that's my little platform, my little speech tonight. <laughs> Wait a minute, don't say this on <laughs> Michaela, don't say this on YouTube. <laughs> but I get your point. Uh, anyway, that's that. Okay. So now let's see what I want. To, um oh I I, I promised you I'd tell you the story of this man. This is this is phenomenal. Okay, so this man is acquitted of murdering his girlfriend. Okay, let me tell you this one. Okay, because I did promise you this. All right, all right. Man acquitted of murder claimed his girlfriend choked to death on his large penis during oral sex. <laughs> Unbelievable. So now, first of all, that is unlikely to happen no matter how big you are unless somebody is preventing your head from moving gagging possible choking shouldn't be happening unless you have a grip on her head where she cannot then move away and if, therefore you are indeed choking her to death asphyxiating her but okay let's say, let's see how this case goes a florida court and this is again why i have problems with the jury system a Florida court found a man not guilty of murder after his girlfriend choked and died, according to his account. According to his account. That's meaningless because he's a lying dog, right? Uh, died while giving him oral sex, a case brought on by his extra large penis. He offered to show the court a photo of his penis <laughs> to prove his case, although the judge declined the offer. <laughs> okay. I really don't care if you hung like a horse. She still can't choke to death unless you hold her head still. All right. The facts of the case pointed to murder. Well, yeah. Richard Patterson did not call the police or paramedics after her death. He left the body of 60-year-old Frances Fran Francesca uh, Machinez lying in her bed for days until her family members began to worry and called authorities. He called an ex-girlfriend, allegedly telling her that he choked Francesca. Then he texted his daughter with an eerie message. Your dad did something really bad last night. Okay. Yeah. So they found her body uh, on October 28th, 2015. And he, Patterson 65 was arrested a short time later. Now prosecutors alleged that Patterson strangled Francesca with his hands, which is also much more likely than this happened during oral sex. While attorneys for the accused claim no one really knows how she died. This is how you the de defense attorneys get guilty people off. 
if you cannot prove 100% how she died, can't, can't find him guilty, then no one knows how she died. Perhaps she choked while performing oral sex, as he claimed. Maybe someone else broke into the home and killed her. Or maybe a heart attack caused her demise. No one knows. Now, mind you, we're going to ignore everything he said, his confessions. We'll just go where we don't know. Why don't they know? The level of body decomposition prevented the medical examiner from ruling a cause of death. The ME could not determine the number of days Francesca lay in the bed before Richard called 911. Right away, if, if you know that woman dies in your in your while you're there and you don't call 911, to me, that's homicide right there. Pretty much. Although people can claim you freaked out because she died of a heart attack. You didn't know what to do. So you just left her lying in the bed to die. This is the defense. The medical examiner did testify in court saying Richard's versions of offense could very well be true. What? <laughs> what? What kind of medical examiner is this? Uh, claiming Francesca could have choked on his penis during oral sex. She could have gagged. She couldn't have choked unless you helped her choke. Don't buy it for a minute. Defense medical expert. Th that was a prosecution's expert. Boy, they need to get a better one. Defense medical expert Ronald Wright also testified claiming that death in this manner was impossible. Wait a minute. Defense medical expert. Something's wrong with this, this story here. <laughs> Defense medical expert also testified claiming that death in this manner was impossible. Wouldn't that be the prosecution and the other one, the defense? I think somebody can't write. Okay. Uh, for this to happen, an individual would have needed oxygen cut off for a minimum of 30 seconds before passing out and then gone another three minutes or more without oxygen before death would occur. Somebody, I, have, I hope this, is, this has got to be backwards. In the end, Jurors acquitted Patterson of second-degree murder because they could not determine her actual cause of death. So in other words, because he let her body decompose a long time, if he did choke her with his hands, they could not prove that. Um, and if he, if he just forced her to have oral sex past her point of being able to breathe, that's also homicide. But the jury said, we don't know how she actually died, so we'll let you off. Unbelievable case. Unbelievable. <laughs> that's it what in the world how is he acquitted that's it yep yep so they it's a it's again the civilian jury i think if this would have been a professional jury they they would have just snickered snickered and found him guilty because she was in his in, she he she was there with her nobody else was she died in his presence he didn't call 911 the story he confessed and the story sucks just because you can't prove it by the because of the decomposition, which he pur purposely had planned. You see, this is this is about when you talk about bodies, like when somebody moves a body someplace far away. One of the reasons they do it is so you can't determine cause of death. Now, sometimes you can. Um, if somebody's been shot in the head and they still have a bullet in their you know the skull, I mean a big hole in their skull, you kind of can prove that. Um, something sometimes a broken highway bone, but then you can say, oh, animals came. Animals came and. And therefore, the, the bones are broken by animals. And so you can't prove a cause of death. Then what you can, only thing you can get the person on is to say, well, um, they messed with the body. In other words, the person died in their house. They freaked out. They took the body someplace and dumped it because they thought they'd be accused of something. So get them for disposal of a body. But you can't prove they murdered them. So that's one of the reasons people get rid of a body as long as they can possibly hide it someplace long enough for it to decompose so that the cause of death goes missing. So that's, um, yeah. So, um, <laughs> what is it? Uh, did he give his CPR afterwards? Uh, apparently not. Yeah. If he said she choked on him, why wouldn't he then try to save her? I mean, Let's assume he didn't, he wasn't holding onto her head really hard, keeping it immobile so that she would choke. Uh, Cause that uh, unfortunately is done uh, during oral sex sometimes where yes, the person can actually have their head pushed in a position which they usually gag. And then that person usually releases them. Um, but if, um, if she's in a position where he's holding her head to the point with his, a big member, um, and she can't breathe. I'm going to be pretty sure she's going to, her eyes are going to get big and she's going to pass out and he's not going to do anything then. I'm going to say he probably strangled her. 
Uh, I don't believe that. I don't believe a silly story. Uh, but no, he didn't. He did not try to save her life. So there you go. Um, <laughs> no member of that jury could beat a rubber plant at Scrabble. <laughs> and I am a Scrabble player. Uh, I, I, I'm, a, I'm a tournament Scrabble player. So I will totally agree with you on that. <laughs> uh, I forgot what happened with Klaus Van Bulo. I don't actually remember that. I'm going to have to look that up and maybe do his case one day, but I, I, I don't, actually don't remember. So um, fa fascinating. Uh, okay, let's see what time I've got here. All right. I want to get to the DNA thing because we've been talking about DNA and how could the Delphi case have gotten DNA? And I found these two cases and I thought they were so interesting about how DNA solved these cases, but not in the way you would think. So this is just so cool. Um uh, in a very sad way, of course, we have, we have somebody who's been murdered, but, you know, but, but just fascinating how, how they got caught. This, this is the first one I want to talk about. Um, she is, hold on a second. Hold on, I've got to find it. Hold on, oh, there we go. Okay. Um, this woman's name is, this is a 1993 murder uh, in Minneapolis, Minnesota. Her name is Betty Eichmann. All right. Um, so anyway, um, wait a minute. Oh no, sorry. Sorry. It's not, that's not Betty. That was her daughter, Je Jeannie Childs. This is, this is Jeannie Childs. Her mother was watching TV when there was discovery, a gruesome discovery of a woman who has been murdered and she recognized the building. And that's where her 35 year old daughter Jeannie lived. All right. She immediately had the feeling that mother should have blah, blah, blah. Okay. She contacted the, she was the first one to contact the coroner and later had to identify her body. Now, what happened to her? Jeannie had been stabbed over 65 times and many of the injuries were caused post-mortem. Evidence was collected and the scene, uh, and at the scene there was foreign fluid found on the comforter, a bathroom towel and bloody footprints. The killer had injured himself in the process, leaving blood evidence behind. So we're not talking touch DNA here. We're talking awesome, solid you know, DNA that can nail the person and not be something questionably that flew through the air and end up, ended up there. The initial suspect list had been vast and included her boyfriend, but DNA evidence had eliminated him. Jeannie had been a sex worker and had often worked from her apartment as she felt it was safer than meeting clients at an unknown location. That doesn't work that way. No, no. Um, her neighbors had given several witness statements for different men they'd seen Jeannie with, but detectives had a hard time locating those men. Do you hear large? There's drilling going on behind me in case you happen to hear that. I think it's something to do with our well water. Anyway, sorry about the now noise. Tell me if it's really horrifying and it's making you impossible to listen to what I'm saying. Because um, I can't do anything about it. <laughs> anyway, uh, it's getting louder. Okay. And I think there's helicopters. Maybe <laughs> maybe they're looking for me. All right. Detectives had a hard time locating the men because a Rolodex had so many phone numbers in them. But they discovered many of them had fake names. All right. It went cold. The case went cold. In 2018, the case was reopened with the hope of using genetic genealogy to locate her killer. However, they were delighted to discover a lengthy genealogical investigation would be unnecessary because a person matching the DNA they were looking for had uploaded their own DNA by, to, to a private DNA company and on, online genealogy themselves. So <laughs> they, they, the killer uploaded his own DNA to, to the genealogy thing, of course, thinking at that point in time that that was not able to be, that would never be used for this. So they found the man, Jerry Rest Westrom, Jerry Westrom. Um, where's Jerry? This is Jerry. There's Jerry Westrom um, of Min uh, Asante, Minnesota. Uh, and then he became, let's see what happened. He was his mid twenties when it would happen. Records showed he lived in Minneapolis at that time. So he was there. He didn't have a violent criminal history, just speeding tickets and multiple drive, uh, driving under influence. And in 2016, he had been caught attempting to solicit a prostitute. So now we have he was in Minnesota. He solicits prostitutes and his DNA is all over that apartment. So he was a well, he had been a well-respected businessman who was married with two children who are now adults and volunteered with several junior sports organizations. This is always so sad to me that this guy is a killer, but yet he's married with two kids like Maybe Richard Allen with Delphi. People don't understand how often this happens. Those who knew him had no idea he was capable of that kind of violence. They put a surveillance on him in 2009, followed him into the hockey rink. And this is what happened. He ordered a hot dog from the concession stand, wiped his mouth with a napkin, and, and then they got it. 
They collected DNA from the napkin and it matched the DNA in the apartment from all those years ago. So anyway, um, let's see. Uh, also, he had distinct bare footprints there that matched his footprints. Uh, let's see. Jur jury deliberated for less than two hours and not unanimous. It's guilty decision. That's a good jury. All right. And now he's in life, uh, life uh, for life in prison. So he uploaded his DNA to the bank, which I thought was just really kind of fascinating. So, <laughs> you know, that worked out really well. Now, now this other one I want to do is this, um, this, this, this girl. So this is another DNA case. So it's interesting how DNA is used and how it gets into the police hands. This girl, this is what happened to her. Brittany Marcel lived in Albuquerque, New Mexico with her mom and her six siblings. All right. Oops. Uh, let's see. 17 year old adjustment. This is a horrifying, horrifying, sad, incredibly sad case. And so kind of bizarre. Um, the 17 year old had just begun her senior year at Shibola High School. I don't know how to pronounce it. When in the blink of an eye, everything changed. On September 11, 2008, Brittany drove home to meet her mother for lunch. Diane arrived moments later and opened the front door. On the ground of the entryway were her daughter's favorite sunglasses. Brittany was lying nearby. Blood was pouring from her head and a man standing over her holding a shovel. That's the shovel. Um, suddenly he dropped the shovel, raced over to the kitchen and grabbed a butcher knife. He chased Diane and screamed, you're next. Diane ran outside to scream for help while a strange man broke into the, broke a dining room window and fled the scene. Brittany suffered multiple skull fractures, a broken jaw, arm and wrist. She spent 10 days in a coma. Miraculously, Brittany survived against all odds, but not without serious life altering injuries. She is left blind in one eye and deaf in another eye. So this, this was, um, this is Brittany before, and you can see she's suffered a lot. Um, she's in her thirties here um, from the, it looks like a, almost a stroke thing on the right side of her face. I mean, thank God she's alive and she's making something of her life after that horrific stuff. Anyway, Brittany had to learn, relearn how to walk, talk and eat. Tragically, she could, this is what's fascinating. Tragically, she could not remember the attack because she'd been beaten the head with a shovel. It left, let alone some of her closest friendships and her entire time in high school. So she had a massive memory loss. The authorities believe that the assault, assault was personal due to its violent uh, nature. Could have been, maybe not, but interesting. I, it, it did look that way. I see where they're coming from. And that was probably a good direction to go. They concluded that Brittany had been attacked from behind as she entered her home. A roll of duct tape was found at the scene, signifying the suspect intended to abduct Brittany. The only other evidence left behind was a single drop of blood. Brittany's attacker cut himself as he jumped through the window. It was entered into the national database, but no matches were found. See the problem? So if he's not in CODIS, if he hasn't committed a felony, he's not found there. Over the years, investigators followed leads, but none, left to, none led to an arrest. Disappointment shrouded the Marcel family time and time again. Okay, eight years later, this is what happened eight years later. Bits and pieces of Brittany's memory finally started to return. And one particular name kept popping into her head, Justin Hansen. Brittany had met Justin when she was in middle school. Back then, she spent a lot of time at her then best friend, Abby's home. Abby's older sister, Lauren, was dating Justin at the time, and he was often at their home, too. Brittany remembered that Justin often visited her at the sunglass kiosk in the mall where she worked. He worked at Hollister at the same floor. Around this time, investigators began working with Parabon Snapshot, a company that can create a computer-generated image and provide specifics uh, such as hair color and ethnicity, ethnicity simply by using a sample of DNA. Investigators were floored when the results came in. The Parabon Snapshot image looked nearly identic identical to the Jeffrey, the, uh, Jeffrey Hansen. So that's the guy on the left, and that's the guy on the right. Now, again... Mm, that I, I personally think the guy on the left, here's what, here's what's always kind of funny about these things. I don't think they can tell skin color, basically, like, you know, they're Caucasian or whatever, or, or African-Americans, biracial, whatever. Eye color, I get that. Hair color, yeah, sure. Freckles, maybe. But I think it's kind of funny because, you know, in reality, there's no way they can know eyebrows, shape of eyes, shape of nose, shape of mouth, shape of ears, and what his hairstyle is. So I think that's a little over-exaggerated, but he was basically that of that sort. 
with skin color, eye color, and hair color. And so they did arrest this guy, and there he is. Uh, they arrested him, and because his DNA, oh, so then, oh, no, what happens is, okay, they made the way to Justin's home, a small village in New Mexico, where the father of four, see, this is so sad, so sad. The father of four was living with his children and his now ex-wife. Justin denied visiting Brittany at the sun, sunglass kiosk and said he barely knew her, but his other friends said that's not true that he always used to stop by almost every day. When Justin refused to provide a DNA sample, investigators were forced to get creative. They followed him to a McDonald's and collected his DNA from a cup he threw into the garbage. It was a perfect match. Stop throwing, you know, when the police are after you, <laughs> don't throw stuff away. Take it with you, put it in your bag, take it home. Because <laughs> if you leave it there, you know, they're gonna, they're gonna grab it because trash is public. It's not your stuff. So. They can do that. So anyway, they did that. It was a perfect match. He was arrested uh, after a decade, and he was charged with attempted first-degree murder and aggravated uh, burglary. Turns out also, this is what's interesting, he had a history of violence against women. In 2004, he was accused of assaulting a pregnant ex-girlfriend. In 2007, he was accused of rape. So you see what you got here? Yeah, serial rapist. So, so this poor girl is trying to... Um, recover from all of this. Uh, but I thought it was interesting. There were two cases with DNA issues uh, found in two different ways. One that, thank God, she remembered who he was because he was never put into the uh, CODIS database because he never committed, I guess, was accused of, when he was accused of rape. Wait a minute. When was he accused of rape? Um, he was accused of rape. Oh, no ch criminal ch uh, charge was ever filed. So he wasn't in CODIS. So if she hadn't remembered his name, they wouldn't have been able to go after him and get that DNA uh, from the cup. So that's pretty amazing. And yeah, and if that idiot hadn't uploaded his DNA to, <laughs> to the genealogy thing, they wouldn't have caught him either. So it's, it's quite amazing. Uh, <laughs> um, I, I, I don't know anything about the shovel belonging to the family. That wasn't in the story, but I mean, yeah. But he used one. That's all I can say. Um, looks like a solid dot. I don't know which one you're talking about. Yep. Um, what's this? Um, yeah, that I, I'd go with that one. Dumb arse. Yeah. Don't you know if you're if you're a criminal, don't upload your DNA anyplace. That's just silly. That's just stupid. Um, yeah. They can just take your rubbish from the bin when you put it out in the bins. Yes, this is true. Once you put your stuff out at the at the at the curb, it's fair game. Um, and I've I've as a, when I was a private investigator, which I was, I had done some cases where I actually did get that information from the curb. And man, Almighty, do you find out a lot about people? You find out what they eat. You find out about their sex life. You find out all kinds of stuff. And if you're lucky like me, the one time I was investigating, I was investigating a deaf man, and he. At that time, we, they didn't have texting. So they had the, these phones and they printed out the entire conversation and then they just throw it in the trash can. So I'm like, oh, look, the conversation, this is cool. So it's kind of like the early version of, if some, please get hold of you, you know, you, after something happens, they can get all your texts. That was the early version. And so, because he thrown it away never thinking anybody would ever access it. So, and I can't remember what the case was even about, but very fascinating. Um, it would suggest it was a planned murder or spontaneous. Uh, well, if you're talking about the girl, the, the girl who was attacked, that was that was planned. He was planning to kidnap her, uh, abduct her. I don't know if he was like, a, at that point, it was a stalker type. But since he supposedly tried to rape somebody, he could have been, you know, a little budding um, serial rapist um, or a serial stalker or serial stalker and rapist. Don't know. Um, but fascinating, those, those things. Um, Let's see. I have one cup. Well, just a couple of things, and then we're we're pretty much out of time. So I want. I just want to mention this one because it made me sad, um, and it's and it shows how how dangerous things can be. See this lovely couple. All right, this lovely couple. They are right in my neighbor. They're in, they're in my 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 county, uh, although not a great part of the county, mind you. Uh, and it's one of those things when I hear that somebody's been killed. He was killed. He was a security guard at the food store, giant food store. Um, and as soon as I see this, I always go, oh my God, this is somebody I know because I know a lot of people in security. I know people in police, you know, and I, and I always look to see, is it in my, is it in my neck of the woods? Um, and then I saw where it was. I'm like, oh yeah, that area. Not, not so, um, not so 
a difficult part of town, shall we say. So anyway, this, this, this is the family. This is the wife. They only married a year. Um, and he was the security guard who was killed. Now, let me read you what happened. This is just, just really, you really wonder what's going on. Um, um, almost every hour, Shantae Tate got a text message from her husband, Willie, while he was at a security job at the giant grocery store in Oxon Hill, Maryland. Now, mind you, being a security guard in a grocery store is not usually the most dangerous job. You know, you know, you think, oh, I'm just going to walk around and once in a while somebody tries to shop with something, but not a biggie. You know what I mean? She had concerns every time he went to work because of the crime in the area. So she was very well aware that this is one of these districts in, in our county that gets a lot of police action. Um, he was trying to leave that location. Poor guy, because he, he knew they both knew was they go work someplace else like my location, my area is, go, is, is much safer area. I wish they'd come out here, but. They were there. We literally talked every day just for me to know he was okay. I did fear for him when he went to that location because the location is rough and he has already been in a several incidents at that location, but able to walk away. He was able to stop people and walk away. On Friday, Tate never got the text assuring Willie was safe. She would soon learn why. Just before 10.30 a.m., we're talking in the morning, not in, not in the middle of the night or not, not near a bar or some kind of thing like that. A giant food store, 10 early, early in the morning, Prince George's County police officer responded to giant. They found out Willie Tate, 43, confronted a suspected shoplifter, a woman named Zayla Akita. She's 20 years old at the front lobby of the store. At that point, Akita pulled a gun from her backpack and shot Tate. He returned fire because he happened to be an armed security guard. He returned fire, but both died. She said they were just, uh, the wife says, we were just, we only, they were about to celebrate their one year anniversary. I'm going to show you a picture of them again because I just think it's sad. Um, we're now planning a funeral when we were planning to have a family vacation. She said her husband was just someone doing his job. Now, family members now distraught are wondering why the suspected shoplifter resorted to ex such extreme action. Now, I've run her name through the Maryland, um, uh, case files to see if she had a history, uh, some kind of history. I can't find it. She might've had a juvenile one, but I can't find anything there in Maryland. Now, mind you, she could have done something in Washington, DC or in Virginia. So now this is interesting. I had somebody else say this to me the other day when we heard it went down. I, I, knew, I have a friend who's a, um, associated with a church. I play table tennis at, and he's one of the elders there. And he, he immediately says to me, oh, maybe she was like, getting food for her children. And I'm like, she shot somebody? <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm not buying this. So anyway, Shantae Tate says her husband was the kind of person who would have offered to help the suspected shoplifter if he knew she was desperate for groceries. If it was food and he knew she was hungry, honestly, he would have just bought the food. He would have just taken her to the register and bought the groceries. I don't understand the reason someone would take a gun to go grocery shopping. Tate leaves behind four stepchildren and two children on his own. Very, very sad. Um, pillar of the community. Not only was he a husband and a father and a brother, he was just an all in all righteous guy. Everybody loved him. If you had a bad day, you found a way to make you laugh. It's freaking sad. And then I looked up this woman. Do you know where she worked? She worked as a line cook at a, at a fish place. <laughs> She's got food. Because usually when you work at a, a restaurant, you get to take something home. If your kids were starving, you could steal the food from the restaurant. I don't buy it for a minute that she, that was the issue. And you're certainly, even if you're shoplifting, you certainly don't shoot somebody over taking food. So I don't know what the whole story behind this thing is. It's super sad, but here's a guy who just says, Hey, you know, you can't take that stuff out of the store. She turns around and kills him. It's a hard job. You know, sometimes I talk about how, you know, serial killers are the uh, uh, security work is the number one job of serial killers. But I've always said this also, a lot of security guards are great guys. And my own son has been a security guard, so <laughs> you know, um, for many years. So I can't, I can't say that all security guards are serial killers. It's not that way. Yeah, um, but it's a, it, it can be a dangerous job, just like police work. And today, when when people are doing some really crazy stuff for no reason whatsoever, it's just really, really a shame. That one just, mm, mm. that one bugged me. You know, um, every time I want to see somebody just getting shot for something so trivial, it's just very, very frustrating. Yeah. Very, very sad. Yeah, they do look like a nice couple. I mean, you know, maybe they're not. I mean, it's a photo, but, you know, I, I just they just look like a nice people. And 
hardworking and happy. And um, yeah, it's just so sad. Um, how did he let her get a gun from her backpack? Because he had no clue she'd pull out a gun and shoot him. Why would anybody do that? You no, know, so she's stealing stuff. Usually what happens when you stop somebody for stealing is they do one of two things. They just say, oh, good. And then they get some kind of half the time now, they don't even get a, a charge, a misdemeanor maybe. Almost now, nothing. Just give the stuff. A lot of times they'll say to you, just give me the stuff and get the hell out of here. And you just walk away. Or you just run. You take the backpack and you run to, run out of there. And the guy tries to chase you. And then you just run. Because that's happening all over the place. But I haven't heard somebody just pulling out a gun and shooting somebody because they ask you to, hey, are you, take, are you stealing something and they shoot you? He never saw that coming. He had no idea that she would do that. And unfortunately, apparently she was close enough to get a decent shot at him. So very, very sad. Just, just, just an absolute shame. Ooh, just, yeah. So, so sad. Um, so I think that's, I think those are the, the ones I had today. Um, yeah, I think I'll stop with that because it's just a very sad story. And, you know, we, and again, the police, I don't know how much she might've been in the system. She might've had warrants out for her, but I couldn't find anything on that. Um, but I, my, I don't believe when people get this real sob story thing, well, I guess she's just stealing food for her children. You don't kill somebody over that. You don't do that. You can, first of all, we get social services. There's so many, there's churches that give out free food. There's pl pantries these days giving a ton of free food. She's 20. And even if she started young, I'm going to say she doesn't have that many children, <laughs> you know, and she works in a restaurant, which she probably can get free food, you know, because it's th things are thrown out, throwing out at the end of the night. And she could steal from them if she wanted to, you know what I mean? Without having to go into John and steal. And I would be curious to see what was in, that she was stealing because here's what sometimes happens. Oh, I had to steal food for my children. And you look in their backpack and they've got prime steak. <laughs> they've got shrimp. Um, you know, they've got top level food here. They, they, they're not stealing ramen. <laughs> you know, so don't, don't give me that story. You know, if you have ramen in there, uh, maybe I'll think your kids are starving. But if you don't have ramen in there and you got steaks, you're lying. You're just, you know, that is just nonsense. Maybe you spent your money on drugs. I don't know. But, and I said, you know, she, I say she even works at a place with fish. So I don't know. Yeah, it, it's insane. It, it, it is a world gone crazy. Sometimes that's what you think. It really is. But very, very sad case. Um, and uh, so, yeah. And she'll be going through the system and God knows what the story. I'm, I'm curious. I'm, I think I'll try to follow it to see what her, her statement is going to be. And what the defense attorney is going to do to try to get her off. And this is what always makes me so sad these days, too, is that I understand a person has a has a right to a defense. But do they have the right to to get try to get out of clear, guilty, you know, clearly you committed the crime. And then then this defense attorney comes in and tries to do all kinds of, you know, a fancy, fancy footwork to convince the jury otherwise, or that she's got psych problems or that she didn't mean to shoot him, blah, blah, blah. You know, it's just, it's sad because, you know, that's why the, the criminal justice system is so expensive, takes so long to get anything done. And that's why so many of the smaller cases get dumped because they, they have these cases that are so huge and so expensive. They can't waste their time. Somebody breaks into your car and steals something too, too bad. You know, they're like, we're not coming out. We don't, okay, we want to take a police report, fine. Talk to your insurance company. We'll never catch the guy. And we're not going to, even, even if we do, they're not going to take it to court. So that's the sad part about it is that when crime gets out of hand, you can't handle any of it. Um, so you need to uh, not let it get to that point. But with our with our lack of uh, police officers these days, and nobody's joining the force, the people are retiring early because they're like, we're done with this. We're having even more of that, and it, more of an issue, and then we're having an even issue in the uh, the uh, the whole the justice system as far as even the lawyers and everything go. They're they're fleeing for um, uh, private work and don't want to work for for the for the state. So that's a mess, big fat mess. Um, oh. <laughs> oh yeah, she is dead. I'm sorry. <laughs> Oops. Well, I guess that case, that case is taken care of. Yeah, she is dead. I, I'm sorry. Yeah, I got too many cases in my head. You're right. She's dead. Um, <laughs> oh, my God. Yeah, she is dead. There will be no trial. <laughs> Thank you for bringing that up. I can't believe I completely, I completely forgot that. 
<laughs> Look, somebody somebody told me, so, so no, there is not any alcohol in here. This is Diet Pepsi. Somebody told me the other day, um, I had like, um, I have, you know, a whole, how, how far high was that up there? Uh, I'm trying to remember for my, for the last thing I did on, on Delphi, a very high number of, uh, it may, it may have been close to 100,000. I'm not even sure now. I have to look at that. Uh, how many people uh, watched the video, right? And let's see, what was it? Uh, it was a, hmm. Oh, it's a 44,000. Okay, 44,000 people watched that video. And I've gotten great questions, great responses, and a few people who are nasty as usual, like, you know, you're a, you know, you're a terrible profiler, blah, blah. This one person says, stop drinking before you do the show. <laughs> I'm like, oh, do I have to? Yeah, <laughs> I guess she didn't go for my personality or something. But um, so no, there's not alcohol in here. But I did forget that she was dead. So <laughs> well, did I prove it or didn't I prove it? <laughs> Oops. Yes. And, you know, it, it's funny because as I tell, try to tell people, when you do an unedited show and you're doing so many cases and you have so much floating through your head, you know, sometimes you just go a little off track and then you're like, oh, I, did, I, did I say that? Or did I forget that? So, yeah, thank you for pointing that out. <clears throat> let me let me repeat it. <laughs> did you say the shoplifter was shot dead? <laughs> yes. Um, it's going to be a very easy defense. <laughs> Oh my, she said, oh, she said, maybe she can use the oral sex defense. Yeah. If she had to go, if she had to go to trial, which, you know, and this is, this is also kind of sad because people often say that's easier if you shoot somebody dead because it prevents the stupid trial. It just solves the whole problem, you know, because they don't, don't have to go through this. If you have a mass murder and you nail them, well, it's over. I mean, the, not the pain for the, people who've been, the children who've been killed, or the uh, citizens who've been killed and their families, but it, there's no trial. You don't have to go through months of months and years of trials and appeals and appeals and appeals. You know, it ends it right there, um, which again, why some people are in favor of the death penalty and one that doesn't take 20 years to, to enact um, on that person, uh, that they would like it to be quicker in certain cases because it prevents having to have appeals for the next uh, two decades. And that, you know, people don't understand how costly that is. And also the fact that over time, information gets lost, misconstrued, uh, twisted. And sometimes people get out when they're still actually very guilty. But this ju the justice system becomes just an incredible, um, I don't know what you even want to call it. It's like, you get it, once it, get, it gets, something gets into the justice system, it's, a, it's an out. A very very tangled web and it costs sometimes millions of dollars on just one case and then we can't provide what we'd le like to provide to the community because we're spending so damn much time on this on the legal side of it um two people can keep a secret if one is dead well that's always true <laughs> but in this case we don't have to worry about that sadly two people are dead and uh, you know one was innocent and uh you know, and yes, and what's also very sad is nobody will hear about this case. This case will disappear in a day. The only people that will ever remember this case is the family because there's nothing to talk about. Crazy girl shot the guy. It's over. I, I do, in spite of the fact it's not going to go to court. I would like to know who she was and why she did this. I would not because I care about so much the motive thing. But I just want to know, has she been in the system a long time? Did people know she was you know, dangerous? How did she get hold of the gun? You know, was it a ghost gun? What, you know, what was it? How did she get it? Um, so I'd like to know. I'd like to know more, be not because I care. She did what she did and she got what she got. I would like to know for when you're trying to protect the community in the future. You need to know these things. And when you're trying to raise children properly, you need to know what dangers are out there uh, that they might run into. Uh, so I want to know more, but I'm going to guarantee you, we won't hear one word about this case. It'll be, it's over just like that because both are dead and the media doesn't care because now there's no supposed mystery. Um, I think there's still a mystery, but they don't really care. They've got other mysteries to move on to.
especially open cases. And you know. so it's sad. It's really a sad. And I wish that we took things a little bit more seriously as far as uh, understanding things. Well, you can't fix crazy, but you can fix other things around crazy because there are, oh, geez, I know I forgot that something. Okay. If you haven't just appeared yet, I just forgot to do this one. I want, I was asked to do this. So I, I'm going to do it before I disappear. Um, uh, it's, it's, um, Colin, where are you? Colin Ireland, because this is UK, UK time frame. Uh, Colin Ireland. Um, the reason I want to talk about this is because the motive thing, that's what you just reminded me. So Colin Ireland, um, who was a, a UK serial killer. Oh, uh, let's see. Where is this guy? Um, he killed a whole bunch of people. Here, here was when he was still, they were looking for this guy. A police are investigating a series of murders across London are anxious to trace a man who has seen at Charing Cross Station or Charing Cross, I'm not sure, around 10.30 p.m. on Saturday, June 12th. He's described as white, 30 to 40, heavy build, six foot plus with a full fattish face. I like that. Short, dark hair, dirty, discolored teeth. He wore a short, dark jacket and jeans. Do you know this man? Have you seen him? Can you help? and tell the Kensington police station people. All right, that's him. He was eventually caught and that's him. Well, he kind of looks just like that picture because actually that was a, that, that, that was, they actually, somebody actually did a good job on that one because he does look like him. All right, good job on that. Um, all right. He is a British serial killer uh, who is known as the gay slayer because his victims were gay. Criminologist David Wilson believes that Ireland was a psychopath. You think? I'm going to say yes. Suffering from psychopathy. <laughs> I learned, now remember how to say that at least. Okay, so Ireland uh, suffered from a severely dysfunctional upbringing, committed various crimes from the age of 16. And this is important because sometimes you have somebody like, I'm studying Jeffrey Dahmer right now. I'm watching the Netflix Dahmer thing because people have asked me to do that. What do you think of D Dahmer and the, and the Netflix series? Um, and a lot of times what you're looking at is to see what kind of uh, home they grew up in to get where they are. Um, and some look, some homes don't seem bad at all. Ireland did seem like he had not the best upbringing. Um, and so he com committed various crimes from the age of 16 and had and he was like, he'd been in prison and let's see what else he'd done. And he sought uh, passive men from gay clubs and say to, uh, they like passive role and sadomasochism. He, oh, the men, he liked the men to like to be passive and liked some kind of bondage thing going on. And the idea for him was if you can get hold of a gay guy who likes bondage, once you bind him up, he's your toy, you know what I mean? And they think you're getting, you think you're getting a sex game out of it and you're getting murdered. So, uh, so that works out really well for him. Ireland said he was heterosexual. He's been married twice to women and he's pretend, he pretended to be gay only to befriend potential victims. Ireland claimed that his murders were not sexually motivated. He was highly organized and carried a full murder kit of rape, uh, of rope, sorry, of rope, handcuffs, and a full change of clothes to each murder. Huh. He is thinking things through, isn't he? After killing his victims, he cleaned the flat of any forensic evidence linking him to the scene and stayed in the flat until morning in order to arouse Suspicion from leaving in the middle of the night. Okay, he ended up he ended up getting um, uh, in, pr in prison. Now he's still there. He's still there. He died. He died in prison. He actually died in fifty seven. <laughs> no more appeals. <laughs> All right. So, but what's interesting about this is he he uh, had a history of criminal behavior. All right. So let's see what he did. Um, in, uh, in his mid-teens, he went in for theft, uh, and then he set fire to another resident's belongings. At 17, he was convicted of robbery. He escaped and was returned. Uh, in attempt to make ends meet, he had a series of manual jobs, but then he was convicted of car theft, criminal damage, and two burglaries, and he was put back in prison. Then he was released again. He lived with a woman and her children for a few months. In 1977, he was convicted of extortion, for which he was sentenced to 18 months in prison. In 1980, he was convicted of robbery, for which he was sentenced to two years imprisonment. In 1981, he was convicted of attempted deception. And then let's see what else. Oh, let's see. He um, he 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 was he divorced after his wife found that he committed adultery, and then he married somebody else. He was violent towards her and stole from her. Then they separated, and she and the children became homeless. And after that, 
He moved to his own flat, and then while he was there, he started going to the gay pub. All right. And his crimes are extremely brutal and extremely uh, fancy, shall we say, and including animals in the house. Now, I'm just going to say that. I'm not going to go through all the crimes he did. But what I'm interested in is this. Uh, so I think it was also David Wilson who came up with the motives for what he did. Let's see, is this it? Um, yeah. All right. The claim is this, and this is where you have to be careful, and, and, and I'm going to do this with Dahmer when I do a whole thing on Dahmer. When you, they speak and they tell you things from the bottom of their little hearts, it doesn't mean it's the truth at all. <laughs> you can understand they're a psychopath. They lie. They lie for many reasons. And you never know where the truth is. And so you can't jump on it and say, oh, that's why. So anyway, serial killer Colin Ireland said he murdered five gay men because he wanted to be famous. All right, that's his claim now. Now, there's a lot of ways to murder people and become famous without doing the incredibly grotesque things he did to these men and their pets. So is that the real reason? Anyway, of course, a newly released documentary. I, I will probably have to watch this documentary at some point because I'll do a whole show on him. I'm going to do a whole series of, of uh, serial killers and the important things. But I just wanted to bring this up today because of the issue of motive. Um, uh, so this documentary reveals possible motives behind his killings in never before seen police interviews. All right. So he said, uh, when he was in prison, uh, he said that he thought of a serial killer as a career that would make him famous. Ireland was 37 when he did all these things. Uh, CBS documentary's Voice of a Serial Killer explores the motivations behind Ireland's infamous killings. So, so he details it, what happened in the crimes and explains why he targeted these gay men. All right. So then I'm going to get through all the gr gruesome things he did. Here's David Wilson again. All right. Um, he told police, now this is interesting, he told police the reason he killed the gay men was so they would keep their mouths shut and don't tell the police things. In other words, he did what he wanted to with the men and killed them because they'd be witnesses, which is one of the reasons, you know, what looks like just, it could have just been rape becomes a sexual homicide because you don't want them to rat you out. So that's one reason. He killed them because he didn't want them to tell the police. They were witnesses. However, some experts have different opinions on the role his sexuality played in the killings, having been, having been prostitute prop, propositioned by men on several occasions as a teenager and having had all his relationships with women fail. <laughs> okay, I'm sorry, but guys, just because your relationships with women fail does not mean you're homosexual. And I'm going to say if you're gay and you have a relationship with a male, uh, you're male with a male, female with female, and your relationships fail, it's not because you're heterosexual. <laughs> I think that's the stupidest thing I've ever heard. That's not proof. It's it's interesting. It's not proof. So anyway, they're saying, yeah. So that might say, you know, he's, he's really gay, and even though he was married. Okay. And which could be. But, you know, that's not why his marriage has failed. His marriage has failed because he beat the people and stole from them. He's a terrible husband. Um, uh, in the documentary, criminologist Professor uh, David Wilson explains his theory on the killer's motive. I believe the confessions of Ireland clearly show a man at war with his own sexuality. You know, and this is a, this is a Dahmer thing too, which I'll get into with Dahmer. I don't know why the, the concept of having some issues with who you're attracted to sexually makes you a serial killer. <laughs> you know, that alone doesn't do it because a whole bunch of people sometimes have issues in their lives. It doesn't make them serial killers. You have to be a psychopath before and then have a desire to control people, to have power over them, to, to harm them, to abuse them, to enjoy yourself doing these things. And the sexuality thing is kind of not the most important thing in that whole, you might use your sexuality. And like, if you're, if you're gay, you might prefer to have rape gay guys and, or not gay guys. You just want to rape people who are men if you're a gay, gay male. And if you're a heterosexual male, you might not want to rape men. You might rather rape women because that's what you like doing. Um, his confessions show no remorse for what he has done. That's because he's a psychopath. But they clearly show how he tried to justify, and I can never pronounce this word, ob obfuscate, obfuscate, right? Obfuscate his behavior. Of course, he's a psychopath. He's going to try to justify what he does and try to lie about it and all that kind of stuff. Um, Wilson continues. He decided on New Year to make a resolution. I'm going to be a serial killer. That's my new career. And he said about it. We don't know that that's true. That's what he's telling Wilson now that he's been caught. 
We don't have any idea if he really wanted to be a famous serial killer or he just got caught and now it sounds like a good thing to say. Um, it's fairly complex as to whether Island was gay himself, which he protests he isn't, which doesn't even freaking matter. Uh, and this was some kind of smokescreen and this was a way of engaging gay men then clearing his conscience. No, he doesn't have a conscience. He doesn't have to clear anything. <laughs> that he was no heterosexual, that no, he was heterosexual. I killed that person. Oh, so now they're saying that he gets with gay men and has fun with them, but then kills him and says, well, the reason I had to kill you because I really wasn't gay. This is where a profiler starts making up stuff. Totally just fabricating stuff in his own head as to a good, an explanation. And you don't need to do that with serial killers like this and psychopaths. Just say they like doing what they're doing and don't waste your time with the rest of it because it's worthless. Others believe his crimes are motivated by homophobia due to the fact he only attempted to kill men who approached him. And in one instance, well, they, the reason he killed the men who approached him because they were appro if they approached him, he could make them victims very easily. Um, after finding out that one of his victims was HIV positive, he admitted taking revenge on him after he was dead by killing his cat. Again, this is coming from Ireland. We don't know if it's all full of crap. And he even cared about that stuff. While initially reluctant to talk to the police after he was arrested, Ireland eventually admitted to all the murders because he'd been caught and couldn't get out of them, and even told the police he slept over his victims' bodies after he killed them in order to not arouse suspicion. Okay, so he's you know he's got his stories. So then you know, so, but I just thought it was interesting that the attempt to constantly try to understand the motives behind these things, and the motive is always the same: power and control. It's just that people get power and control in different ways. So uh, some people get power and control over, I don't know, becoming a, 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 a boxer. So they get in a ring and they can fight and then they can win fights. Yeah. Some people get power and control by uh, becoming a professor at a college where they, 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 get, they get a lot of respect and they can command a whole classroom of kids who look up to them. You know, I mean, people get power and control over all kinds of ways, joining the military, uh, you know, these are and becoming a politician. These are all things you do to get power and control, not necessarily negative things either. We all do this with our lives. But if you're a psychopath, you find a way to get power and control, which might be a little bit odd or even violent or even horrific. But for us to try to sit there and try to figure out what was his real motive, his motive is power and control. The other stuff is just his way of expressing it. Stop trying to figure it all out to the little teeny you know, you can't do it because he's a liar and you're just making up stuff. And so don't make up stuff because you don't know. <laughs> you just don't know. And I just thought that was an interesting um, thing with Colin Ireland. And it just he was also, by the way, one of the people that did have a criminal history, a really long criminal history, because he was just a nasty piece of work. Uh, and some serial killers who do have the family and the kids and all that stuff and have seemingly nice life can pull off being pleasant most of the time. This guy isn't pleasant. He was only pleasant for maybe 10 minutes until he got you into his apartment and killed you. But he wasn't pleasant to his wives. He wasn't pleasant to, he was just an all around kind of natural, nasty criminal um, who I don't know why it took him so long to get him. Um, <laughs> I think your drinking before the show just makes it better, Pat. Keep it up. Oh, sure. Okay, I'll do that. <laughs> um, wait a minute. Mission. There's no such thing as mission oriented, by the way. Wait a minute. Let me let me go. Um, I'm not sure what you said. Hold on a second. Um, mission oriented. Um, a lot of people. That's that's something the FBI came up with. With when guys kill prostitutes, they they claim they were mission oriented. That they wanted to clean up the world. That was their motive. And it's garbage. Uh, prostitutes are easy, easy victims. That's basically it. They're easy victims because you can you can get them in your car simply. You can get you know easy get easy to get a loan. Um, and they don't when the when the police find a prostitute, people say they didn't care enough to you know work that hard to solve crimes about with murdered prostitutes. But a lot of it is just just so many again so many suspects. It could be it could be your pimp. It could be it could be one of the Johns. It could be a drug dealer. It could be so many people it's a difficult case to solve. Um, there are ways, in my opinion, uh, which I'm going to try to uh, put into the program I'm developing uh, on, on serial homicide. Um, but that they want to clean up the streets? Oh, heck no. <laughs> they don't care about that. <laughs> um, that's what happens when you break with the tradition of murdering hookers. <laughs> well, you know, it's a point to that. 
when you murder two girls in Delphi, all hell breaks loose. Everybody's looking for you. But if you if you do go into the city and you murder a prostitute and throw her on the side of the road, that they let me put it this way: you do not have the community doesn't go crazy. So when the community, you always have these small groups. They'll say, "Oh, it's terrible. The police didn't care about the the, the just they didn't care about these women because they were prostitutes." Well, the community didn't care about them either. They care about two teenage girls. They don't care about a couple of prostitutes that got murdered who are doing drugs. No, they don't care nearly as much until it gets to be an interesting mystery like Long Island serial killer. Then suddenly everybody's like, oh, you know, then they care. Um, <laughs> um, uh, Benny says, Pat, I look forward to your show on Dahmer as it's the serial killer I have studied the most and find most interesting of them all. He, in my opinion, is quite different from most other serial killers. Yes and no but I'll explain that when I do the show, <laughs> when I do the show. Um, uh, Midge says, uh, his denial of being homosexual sounds like BS. He was probably self-loathing about his sexuality. No, we don't know that. See, that's the whole point. We don't know that he really is self-loathing. That's the, again, what the, what, what, what the profilers come up with because they want to come up with a, a, an intelligent motive, taking out on his gay victims. We don't know that at all. It's just like... Uh, it's just like serial killers who kill men who kills to rape and kill women. Do they really hate women? Or they just, generally speaking, serial killers don't like anybody. I mean, they don't have to, <laughs> they don't, they don't like anybody because everybody, they all think they're better than me. You know, they're all trying to get over on me and they don't care about anybody. They're all like pawns on their chessboard. So they're just picking out which pawn they want to take care of. Uh, sometimes they kill somebody who they think is a trophy to the community. That gives them a big thrill out of killing the, the cute blonde cheerleader. That's awesome. Um, or it can be convenient, easy, you know. Um, so, yeah, so uh, Ireland <laughs> says, uh, hey, come back to my place. I like to do bondage. And the guy's like, oh, that's cool. Goes back there, ties him up, and it's like, too bad. Now, is it because he loathes the guy or or, home, or, or, or being, being gay? Or is it just it's a good way to get a guy tied up? You know, um, I think it is a little harder to find women who will get go through that, but that does seem to be sort of a, you know, bondage thing is more popular in certain communities, not saying, but you know, but again, that's why guys pick prostitutes because a prostitute, if you say, hey, I have a hundred bucks, unless you're holding a, an ax in your hand and waving it at her, she'll get in your car because she needs the money. Uh, you know, you're on Craigslist and somebody says, hey, come out to my place, you come out to the place and you're never seen again. So unless you have good protection, you get you can get killed very easily. Same with just going home with somebody from a bar. I mean, a, a, a psychopath has practiced enough to know who is going to be an easier victim, and he just has to pick a victim that he's going to a enjoy um, in his own way uh, and be successful with. But for for to, for me to set back and say I know the motive of Ireland, I don't, and it's all garbage, except for power and control. The rest of it, don't know. It's somebody's perception or it's his lies. And we just don't know. So I stay away from uh, profiling, which I think is bunk. Because I don't know. Um, <laughs> and we probably will never know because he's dead. And he's not going. <laughs> he's dead too. <laughs> oh, I love being caught. Oh my gosh. <laughs> but uh, I, I almost forgot to do Ireland. I was asked to do that one. So I move on a second. Oh, okay. So I saw these these texts come in, and I'm like, ah, there's something going on. Um, anyway, that's going to be it for today. Um, and again, there's always some interesting things happening during the week that are, you know, pop up and fascinating cases that people either send to me or I run into. Um, so I hope you enjoyed this um, this round of uh, uh, the hangout. And uh, oh, so if you're from Australia. Um, uh, and you're a patron and you see this, or you see my the patron chat, I'm, I think I may try to do a, a special Australian case this Friday night because that's Saturday during the day in Australia. People can be awake. Um, and I'd love a new Australian case that's really good. So anybody can send me those ideas over. I'm not sure what I'm doing for Sunday yet. I'm not quite there. I've got a kind of a crazy busy week, but I'm going to try to get it all in. So there we go. Uh, <laughs> Oh, thank you, Martin. Cool show. Thank you. I appreciate that. And thank you, Bishop. I appreciate that too. Um, let's uh, let's see. Uh, Lana says, Gretchen and Robin. Yes, that is how he is similar to the oral sex guy. Guilty as sin, but acquainted. 
acquitted after the second trial, Hyde Dershowitz. Who are we talking about? Wait a minute. Who are we talking about? Now I'm now I'm wondering because it's Dershowitz. Oh, really? Mm hmm. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, where, where do you send case ideas? Uh, just uh, message me. Just message. It's just, uh, just straight through messaging. Um, oh, Klaus. Oh, him. Oh, and he could afford Dershowitz, couldn't he? Okay, he's on my list. He's on my list. I'm going to look it up. Um, so, yeah, let, let me let me check it out. I mean, this it's amazing how many cases there are in the world. It's just it's sadly shocking, you know. It's like so so many things to catch up with. But I'm gonna put them on the list as well. It's what? <laughs> I'm not sure what that is. <laughs> I think that's a typo, right? What is that? Insulin? What's that? Insulin? <laughs> I don't know what that is. But anyway, uh, thank you for being here. It's been great as usual. Um, and uh, again, if you're new to the, the channel, please do like and subscribe. And if you'd like to join the group here join patreon and I'm always happy to have you there oh he shot her okay i i know i vaguely remember the case but i, I you know it's somewhere back in that memory that i don't have so, <laughs> so all righty then all right so i will see some of you um on friday if i do that show if i get a great australian case and otherwise i will see you on sunday when I do the regular case, which I do not know what it is yet. So there we go. Um, and it's always great having you here in the chat room. And um, so much fun. All right. I'll see you next time. Bye. Bye.